Hi, I'm Dr. Yasser Metwali. I'm um, a specialist in joint replacement hip and knee specialty. Um, I graduated from uh, Mayo Clinic um, where I learned how to do a joint and uh, replacement for knee and hip. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the preoperative uh, summary that I give my patients for a hip replacement. If you look at a hip replacement surgery, what we do is we take basically the uh, ball of the hip and replace that with another metal ceramic ball. And then the uh, socket, we core it to match a titanium and a plastic um, uh, socket as well. When you look at a hip replacement surgery, it's one of the most successful operation in medicine. It's 98% successful to help your pain and improve your quality of life. 97% of patients would go through it without major complications. 97% of patients at one year would say, man, I wish I would have done it sooner because they are quite satisfied with the outcome. So if you look at the a complication or the risk with this operation that we're really concerned about whether it's a patient or a physician, it's usually infection. Infection is about maybe a half a percent, which one out of 200 patients of all comers might get an infection. So a patient will ask always like, what would I do to try to help myself reduce my risk of infection? Certainly if you're diabetic, controlling your diabetes is really important. So your doctor will order an A1C, which is a blood test to measure the overall uh, control of your uh, diabetes. We would like to see it below seven. Uh, the second thing for female patients, we tell them not to shave their legs with a razor from five days before until two weeks after. The little small nicks that you can't see that the shaver can do can actually increase the bacterial load on your skin and that will lead to an increase of an infection. Secondly, all patients would need to use the Hippoclin shower the night before and the day of the surgery to reduce the bacterial load on our skin. And that's the bacteria where 99.5% of the infection comes from. So by improving that, you already reduce the risk of infection significantly. The second risk is blood clots. Unfortunately, blood clot after a hip or knee surgery doesn't differentiate sex or age. So about 3% of patients, no matter what they do, might get a blood clot. So what can we do to try to reduce our risk? Obviously for patients, we um, uh, divide them into two different categories. A category where people have a history of blood clots and a category of uh, patients that didn't have a history of blood clots. So we call them low risk. Low risk patients would go on aspirin twice a day. They also use a, a cuff uh, throughout the first three weeks. Uh, the cuff is put around their calf and it compresses the muscle and the blood to reduce any stagnation of blood that leads to blood clots. Secondly, the patient with high risk, they will use the same cuff, but they have to go on a formal anticoagulation like Coumadin or something called Xeralto. Obviously, we'll decide accordingly with the patient according to their condition. And thirdly, dislocation. For a hip, um, it can dislocate in about one to 4% if you have a posterior um, approach, and that's called the standard approach. But in an anterior approach, the dislocation risk is about 0.5%. So it significantly reduces. This is a truly minimally invasive surgery with an anterior approach. And obviously that would reduce the risk of dislocation. It does not completely eliminate it. Um, so who qualifies for it? Uh, in my practice, about 95% of patients will qualify for an anterior approach. About 5% will qualify for, for posterior approach. Um, so what makes me decide? Um, first, uh, the patient, their strength, their body habitus, um, their anatomy um, of, of the bone, as well as the quality of the bone. So people with soft bone, people with congenital deformity, uh, those ones might actually go through a standard posterior approach because it's a lot safer for them uh, from the operation and the long-term survival than it is for the anterior approach. 
So when we look at the follow-up after surgery, so the follow-up usually goes this way, two weeks to check on your incision and maybe uh, give you a prescription for your um, pain medication and uh, monitor your progress. And at six weeks, uh, this is the uh, visit where we look and decide whether you're gonna need physical therapy and also see the x-ray at that time. This is a baseline x-ray that we use for the follow-up afterwards. Most people, I will tell them I'll see them at one year after that, and from that one year, we'll see every five years. And the reason for that, we can monitor the health and the survival of the implant, and at that way, we can detect some of the problems a lot earlier than, uh, you know, than losing more and more um, a bone stock that we can do revision on. The second question a lot of people will ask me, well, how long would this uh, implant survive? Well, if you look at the studies from implant 20 years ago, 80% will be in today. So we accept about 1% failure per year. So 80% of the implant will last eight, uh, 20 years or more. We also project that the implant that we use today and the approaches that we use today maybe will even improve that further. Um, as far as the surgery goes, uh, whether it's a standard or an anterior approach, it takes about an hour and a half. The hospital stay for 80% of patients is about one day. Uh, some people accordingly will stay longer or sometimes they will leave the same day. Those ones contribute about 20% of, of uh, patients, but the 80% will stay overnight. Um, most people ask me about the dressing. So usually I tell them to not touch the dressing until two weeks when you come and visit me. Uh, the dressing that I put on for hip replacement are impervious or waterproof, so you can shower as soon as you get home right away. Obviously, if the uh, dressing is soiled, I would recommend that you call my office and then we'll uh, direct you to how to deal with it. And sometimes we'll ask you to come to the office where my nurse or me will uh, address uh, how we wanna deal with the dressing at that time. Also, the hospital will give you a uh, package of dressing that we can direct you over the phone how to use it, and, uh, and the nurses will tell you before your discharge how to use that dressing as well. Two things I ask my patients to uh, do um, and be responsible for, their pain control as well as their swelling. So as far as the pain control is uh, concerned, I would like you to control your pain by using Tylenol every eight hours, using anti-inflammatory if you're not allergic twice a day, and use narcotics that I prescribe for you on a regular basis, at least in the first 10 to 14 days. Uh, usually a hip operation is not very painful, which is very lucky for us, and most people require just Tylenol or slight uh, narcotics at the end of the day. Expect that you'll be tired in the afternoon and you would like to take a nap. That's very normal because you will spend a lot of energy to trying to heal the bone to the implant as well as your tissues um, to heal to each other as well as your wound. So that's not unusual. 70% of patients will have low-grade fever in the first 10 days. That's very normal. The area of the wound will be warm. That's very normal because there's a lot of activity of healing. Um, so that would uh, be, we would decide on infection if patient becomes ill, sick. So just the warmth of the incision does not necessarily mean it's infection. Um, the other thing is swelling. That's very, very important. Swelling is like water. So it follows the gravity. If you're up and around and moving, then obviously your leg will get a little swollen. Every patient is different as far as their circulation efficiency. So I would recommend that you would use an ACE bandage from the toes to all the way just above the knee to try to control that swelling and reducing it. Uh, patients, uh, patients, when they have a swelling of the leg, it actually increases their pain, reduces their mobility. So I think you wanna control that. The second thing to control it is elevation as well as ice. These are the three things that you can do to try and help that swelling. The frequency of it, I give a baseline to my patients and tell them, I would like you to walk five to 10 minutes every hour and keep it elevated 10 to 20 minutes every hour. That's kind of a guideline. And then you can move forward or backwards from there. It depends on your tolerance as well as your swelling. Usually after two weeks, these things will kind of dissipate gradually and you get back to your normal by six weeks. And finally, I wanna uh, talk to you about something really important, which is constipation. 
A lot of people find this funny. Actually, I don't. I think this is really important for your recovery. Imagine if uh, you have a constipation for two, three days. That would affect your bowel. It would affect your pain. It would affect the way you feel. So I instruct my patients to take at least Miralax twice a day and see if they will, can be regular every day. To be regular is so important. So what actually causes the constipation? Anesthesia causes the constipation, as well as your pain medication and lack of mobility. All of those can have it. A lot of people will tell me that, man, I haven't eaten that much at all. So I'm not expecting to have a bowel movement. That's actually not true. Your bowel shed their layers every three days. So you need to have a bowel movement every 48 hours. So I start with a Miralax twice a day. If that doesn't work, I then Ducalax, which is an actual laxative. And if that doesn't work, I will ask my patients to get uh, magnesium citrate. And it's a liquid bottle. So you take half of the bottle, wait an hour. If there's no action, then in an hour, you take the other half. Finally, you will get suppositories and enemas afterwards. You cannot let the constipation lasts 48 hours or longer. So that is a responsibility you need to take. A lot of people, obviously their diet improves their bowel movement by having fiber diets, uh, salads, um, as well as prune juice or prunes in general can improve that. So I hope that that never comes as a complication that you might face, but it certainly helps to uh, preemptively work to resolve it.